and welcome back to episode number two of the International Greenkeepers for Hire podcast. This podcast is made by greenkeepers for greenkeepers. My name is Brad and I am your host on this greenkeeping podcast. First off, I just wanted to thank everyone who took the time to listen to the first episode. If this is your first listen, you can check out episode number one on YouTube and Spotify to listen to my interview with the creator of this group, Daryl. We will soon be available on iTunes, so keep your eyes out for us on there. On today's podcast, I managed to have a chat with two fantastic guys from Mountain View Seeds in America. So here with me today, I have Brett and Chas from Mountain View. Would you both like to start by telling me a bit about what you do and how things happen, really? Yeah, a little bit about our company. It started started about well in 1946 is the grower cooperative when that started but the seed company the marketing side started in 1998 and basically started out with uh, cool season turf grasses and um, as the company grew we decided we needed to be more vertically integrated and so we started up our own grass breeding entity called peak plant genetics and um we needed to do that we were a smaller size company at that time and a lot of the big breeding entities were getting bought out by very large seed companies and we knew that we were going to get choked out if we didn't control the germplasm coming into into our business so we took and went in partners with uh, one of the best uh, cool season grass breeders in the u.s mr steve johnson and um, the cooperation between us and him and, and Peak Plant Genetics started about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. And um, so, yeah, that's our business is, is not only breeding cool season turf grasses, um, but the wholesale side of those. And I guess over the last 20 years that Mountain View's been in business, um, we've become known as probably one of the um, say within the states one of the top two top three providers of cool season turf grass to professional sports venues okay so do you guys just deal in the states or do you globally or globally so we're marketing to to every continent basically Um, south america central america um, europe all of asia going into, of course, Japan, Korea, China, um, you know, the, the majority, Australia as well, New Zealand, um, the majority of the product, yeah, it, it, it goes into the States, but when you look at uh, cool season turf grass uh, consumption, that's that's where a huge portion of the usage is, so, but the, the uh, international market, that's expanding for us significantly over the last six, seven years. Oh, that's awesome. Um, just out of curiosity, more than anything, I know the, the the strict laws behind bringing things into Australia. How how do you get by that with with seed? Yeah, the seed side of it's relatively easy. There's uh, phytosanitary restrictions, um, simple seed tests that our uh, government agencies do on each seed lot. And so, Australia, it's uh, it's not the easiest, but it's it's not the most difficult by far. To, to export seed to. I understand that a lot of R&D goes into developing new grass seeds, but um, could you briefly explain the process? Yeah. Um, so we work with uh, several university partners to get our germplasm and then bring it out to Oregon. So primarily we, we work with uh, Rutgers University, um, and so they do a lot of the, the back-end work. So they're making trips to Europe um, and to other continents to do collections of the grass seed. Um, they have a partner over in Holland that'll grow the the uh, grass that they have selected and produce seed out of it, and then we have to import the seed into the U.S. So we can't use vegetative plugs or sprigs to bring them in. So we're getting the seed in that gets um, brought into Rutgers. They go through several years of screening um, and develop a variety, and then from there we take that variety and finish it off in Oregon. Um, and so we do a lot of the back-end breeding for seed yield. We'll screen for a lot of our cool season diseases that we see in Oregon, um, like microdochium patch or pink snow mold. Um, and then we'll also 
um, screen for winter growth since we have a lot of winter growth and that's an important part. Um, and then we also do some of our own breeding work from start to finish at Peak Plant Genetics as well. So we're, we finish off and we develop new varieties as well. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for all cool season grasses. So, How do you decide what seed mixture is right for what site or you know, what type of what variety of grasses is right for the site? Well, we do a lot of independent testing through universities. So with the NTAP in the U.S., we're able to have our grass seeds in all the different kind of climatic environments in the U.S. And so by looking through a lot of that data, we're able to see which region our seed does the best in and then kind of look at that climate data and try to relate that internationally to other countries. Um, we also do some contract work for some of the out-of-box kind of stuff that we've been looking at. Um, some of the blue muda that we talked about, we've, we're just kind of throwing everything at it to see what sticks, and we found some unique things there um, that are pretty interesting. So it's a lot of trial and error, um, and it comes with experience. So we've got quite a big, bit of experience with our sales staff, um, and so usually someone within the group has experience of what does well where and, and uh, kind of how to go forward. But there has been cases of um, things we don't expect, either customers per pushing it out of what we think the, the range is and they do well. And so there's always some eye-opening experiences that we see and they kind of push the boundaries. So, you know, example would be tall fescue, the newer generations of tall fescue, um, the genetics is getting so good and the heat tolerance and drought tolerance is getting so good. It's getting per pushed further and further south in the United States, which, you know, 10 years ago, we never would have expected. So that's kind of been neat to see. So Yeah, a lot, of going, a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's um, interesting finding these new homes for different grass species and seeing how, um, you know, two different species will, um, you know, kind of interact with each other and, and become a, you know, a stand and coexist together. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. There's, a, there's a huge investment that the consumer doesn't even realize that's going on at the university level, whether it's University of Kentucky, University of, of Rutgers University. Um, they're, they're trialing thousands and thousands of turf plots each year, tens of thousands of turf plots each year. And um, some of those turf plots... They're low maintenance turf plots, um, low input turf plots, um, drought studies, uh, shade shade tolerance. Um, they're going out, they're coming up with every mixture under the sun of species to go and rate them and actually put some science behind what's happening. Not just uh, some of the companies that have an oversupply of a certain certain species and then they go to the consumer and say, hey, this is what's good for you. when." reality was they just had an oversupply situation and they're trying yeah. to get, trying to get, get rich. inventory yeah. going. <laughs> so we've had to lean back on university data um, on multiple occasions, going and telling our, our end users, no, that, that's, not the, that's not the mixture you want to go with. Even though company A is selling it and saying it, look at the university data, it's independent, it's independent data, and that's where the proof is, and that's not the best product. That, uh, that you want to go with. might be the cheapest, but that's not the best product that you want to go with. So we're currently at the Science and Innovation Day at Sydney University, and you guys performed a brilliant seminar earlier, just so that the viewers know. Um, there was a question, well, what you mentioned on the, on the slideshow, about, um, say, if I brought a, a mixture of grass seed off you now, and in four or five years' time, I want the same mixture again because for X, whatever reason, my grass has died or, you know, uh, is that available to me? Can I get the exact same mixture? It, it can depend, honestly. Um, you know, companies, we try to be on the front end of the breeding cycle and um, on product development. So probably the varieties that last the longest they're probably on an eight to 10 year cycle um, as far as from introduction to market to when they start to be phased out. So long and short is, yeah, the, uh, the varieties, they're constantly being updated um, to go on five, six years down the road, try to find the exact same mixture, the exact same varieties. It's, it's going to be tough, but um, as long as 
as long as the consumer is buying um, an equivalent product from, if it came from us, if it was like a top choice blend and it's one of the product lines that we put our elite products in, if they come back four, five, six years later and they buy a similar blend, they're, they're going to be happy with what the, uh, the reseeding results would be. It's going to be similar enough that they're not going to be uh, feeling bad about what they did. So if they go and just grab any mixture off the shelf, um, yeah, they could have significant differences and, mm -hmm. and uh, a real patchwork going on in their, in their yard or on their sports turf that they're not going to be happy with. I think another important point to, to kind of focus on there too is a um, seed stock program, which we've got a, a very good seed stock program. And so that's what we establish all of our seed production fields is out of a seed stock program. So that's being grown from the breeder seed. So what the breeder intended that variety to be. Um, and because it's an open pollinated uh, crop and you have anywhere from you know, three to 30 different parental lines that go into that, you can get natural selection of those fields over time and that variety can shift if you don't have a true seed stock program or you leave a field in too long. Um, so for anything that we have that's under a PVP can last for five years in a field under certification and then beyond that it's uncertified. Um, and then when we go to reestablish the field, we don't take from, you know, seed that goes on the um, to our end consumer, we take from our seed stock, which is based off a of breeder seed, which the breeder produces. So that's what his idea of that variety or cultivar is. And so we stay as close to that as possible. With some that don't have good seed stock programs, you can see a variety shift over time based on natural selection in the field. So it's no longer what that original variety is. Um, so that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, um, especially in the seed production side, is having a good seed stock program. So there's definitely some companies that keep a lot tighter handle on on that exact circumstance. Um, we deal with over we've got 500 grower um, owners that own the cooperative, and probably about 180, 190 grow grass seed for us. And um, so we have pretty good intel on what some of the other companies are doing as well. And um, we've seen seen firsthand how other companies haven't kept a tight handle on those genetics and they've like Chaz said they'll pull from a production field to plant the next production field to plant the next production field and where they're open pollinated varieties there can be a significant shift and um, what the variety started out as 10 years ago 12 years ago it can be night and day difference um, you know as of today versus where it started out and then the endophyte as well, so we, we talked about that, and um, there's an example of a fine fescue that was a top-performing one that had an endophyte in it. Um, it was re-entered in an NTAP cycle five years later and didn't perform as well. Uh, come to find out that that had lost the endophyte in the seed, which is why it wasn't performing as well as before. Um, so that's just something that we always monitor throughout the process is endophyte levels um, from the breeder seed all the way through kind of the end um, and what we're sending out. So we have an idea that the endophyte levels are still high and maintained in our turf grass seeds. So, and, and the opposite as well. So for our forages, you know, we want to make sure unless it's a, a novel endophyte or a grazing friendly endophyte, we want to make sure that those are endophyte free. So kind of two sided there. We, we want it in turf. We don't want it in, in forages for the most part. So, so yeah, there's a big effort put to, um, keep the varieties true to type. So the example that Chaz said, there's a fine fescue variety that was at the top of the NTEP five years ago, then it gets re-entered in the NTEP and it didn't do well because it lost its endophyte. Well, we've made a big effort as far as putting in cold storage, as far as protecting those, uh, that germplasm, those genetics to, to make sure that that, that uh, endophyte is preserved. So when our customer, when they look at look at a turf trial, whether it's the National Turf Evaluation Program, the NTEP trials in the U.S., or whether it's trials at the STRI in, um, in the U.K., wherever they look at trials that have our varieties and they see where they score, basically what we want to do is make sure that 
we go and protect that germplasm, make sure that if you buy that variety from us today, the year that the, uh, the trial's finished, if it was number one or two in the trials, we want to ensure that four, five, six, seven years from now when you buy that variety from us, it's the same, same product as what it was represented the day that it rolled off the production line. And um, that's not always the case in our industry. Yeah, well, that, well that's why we asked the question because, um, you know, to have that peace of mind is, especially when you, you know what you can produce out there and you, you want to keep producing it. So, uh, so what future projects do Mountain View have in store? Is there anything you can tell us? You know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, closed we, doors. we've got a we've got a couple of top secret things uh, that we're working on. Um, I think we, we've got a big announcement at GIS this year, uh, the golf industry show in the U.S. that we're going to announce. Um, probably can't quite slip the beans out uh, on this <laughs> podcast, but um, yeah, we've got a lot of cool things coming. Um, we talked about today in the, the presentation about blue muda or the bluegrass Bermuda kind of hybrid system fields with the cool season and warm season grass playing together. Um, we've, we've done a little bit of trialing on tall fescue blue muda fields for sports turf. Um, we've got one year of data on that. It looks pretty promising. Um, so we're going to continue to kind of push that way. Um, but I think for us as a company, we see that you know, the, the important things coming on the future is, is uh, water conservation, uh, sustainability, um, low input turf grass, so low fertility, low chemicals. Um, so we're looking for things that we can maintain, you know, the same level of quality with lower inputs of fertilizers and chemicals. And so a big push um, in our breeding program as well as the Rutgers breeding program is, is disease tolerance, disease resistance. Um, we're looking at salt tolerance as well. We're, you know, we're losing fresh water, so we've got to come up with alternatives. So, you know, using effluent water to water. Um, heat and drought's always a big one. Um, so Rutgers is, is good enough that they have several rainout shelters so we can test a lot of our varieties um, without rain. And then in Oregon, um, we don't get rain for about 90 days during the summer, so we can simulate drought conditions throughout the summer as well. So um, with that, we can come up with pretty good grass varieties that, that need quite a bit less input than they used to in the past. Um, yeah, continuing to push programs like the A-List that we started a few years ago. It's the Alliance for Low Input Sustainable Turf. Um, more municipalities um, are starting to push that idea that with water restrictions, fertilizer restrictions, chemical restrictions. And so... Uh, we felt it was important to go and actually have real life, um, real data, uh, independent data, essentially university data that could tell the real story behind varieties. A lot of the, a lot of the industry, it's been um, private trials that, you know, like everybody knows, private trials, you're the one in control of the data, so exactly, yeah. you can um, control the narrative. and. That's not, um, that's not doing the consumer any good. So we're a huge proponent behind things like A-List where it's university data. Wherever the numbers fall, they fall. And so the consumer can get the best product. Um, things like National Turf Eval Evaluation Program or the ANTEP that's happening here in Australia right around the corner. Um, it's all independent data. So... Um, doesn't matter how much money each company has everybody's on the same level and everybody can see the end results and the consumer can can look and um, and choose for themselves what the what the best varieties and the best germplasm is and we've always felt comfortable pushing that narrative because we're confident in in where our stuff's going to go and land in those type of trials the other thing I think that a lot of people don't see is that we're also investing a lot of money and technology into the seed production side of it. It's become more and more difficult to produce seed, clean seed in the valley. Um, we can no longer burn our fields, which helped with controlling annual bluegrass and, and uh, uh, seed in the in the soil bank there. Um, so it's becoming more and more difficult to get the you know zero zero seed or zero weeds, zero soil in it. Um, and so we've invested quite a bit of money in, in how we can control um, weeds and seed production fields. And um, we've invested in um, some trials looking at um, 
both herbicides and PGRs and different chemicals and fertilizers to improve our seed yield and uh, maintain our seed yield while controlling the weeds in the field. So that's going to be, I think for the next 10 to 20 years, that's going to be the, the biggest push in the, in the seed world is how to get clean seed and, and how are we going to produce this clean seed. Because everyone wants zero zero, everyone wants clean seed, no one wants yeah, of course, yeah. you know, seed with weeds in it. So that's going to be a, a big push for the future, not only for us, but all seed companies. So something that we're, we're very aware of and, and investing time and money into. So, And that's probably become something that's, um, I suppose, a, a bigger challenge in, in agronomy over the last 10 years is that um, the consumer, when it comes to cool season turf grass, they've started to, I suppose, be more educated, which is, which is great. That's what we want them to be. Um, but they're starting to realize the value in in zero crop, zero weed type seed lots. And what we mean by that is just basically um, pure seed without contamination. Um, a lot of the industry for years, um, just standard standard quality seed lots could have, um, you know, 0.25 other crop or weeds, half a percent other crop or weeds, which can make, can make turf look horrid. And um, so, over the years, customers have started to figure out if they pay a higher price and actually buy a better product, they're a lot happier with the results. And so, and maybe it wasn't the consumer as much that started to figure that out as our wholesale distributors, that when they started to buy that next layer of quality, um, the clean stuff, they started to realize that their phone wasn't ringing with complaints so much, yeah. which meant that it was happy customers. And so... What you used to see is maybe 50% of the, uh, the market wanting zero crop, zero weed type stuff. Now it feels more like it's 80% of the market that wants and demands that type of product. So it's good, but when you're dealing with agronomy, um, always producing that type of quality isn't always the easiest, easiest deal. Yeah, I can well imagine, especially, you know, you, what, what do you do with the contaminated seed? You've, you've got it, you know. Yep. Um, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always places for stuff like that. But, you know, as a turf manager, you probably don't think about the back end and yeah. how seed's produced. And uh, it's uh, it's interesting to get a different perspective on the, the seed industry. So it's something that was foreign to me up until about three years ago so you know seeing the other side there's a lot that goes into it that yeah, you don't expect exactly so. we just order a bag of seed and it turns up and it's you expect it to be clean and all that seed yeah and and seed. And we don't know any of the process that goes on behind it so it's it's great to hear it all and how it works and all the tests the trials and yeah all the things you guys got going on there yeah so do a quick plug for our field day next summer uh, June 23rd and 25th, we do a field day out in Oregon every other year, um, and we bring people out to look at our seed production uh, and also look at our turf plots and kind of just do an overview of Mountain View as a company uh, and then do a tour of our facilities and things like that. So um, oh, that's nice. if there's people interested in it, they can get a hold of Brett or I, and uh, we can make it happen. But usually have about 100, 150 people come to our field day during the summer and get a look at all the different varieties not only ours but industry standards as well so uh yes it's a pretty cool day and is, is that open for all is that just contact you and you yeah, yeah for, for the most part it's mostly our distributors that come in but um you know if there's people that want to come out to it we're, we're more than happy to be flexible and, and bring them in right <laughs> <laughs> as Brett gives me the looks, look here looks like jazz is controlling the budget <laughs> yeah watch your emails yeah a few <laughs> you gotta make it to oregon though <laughs> so here's a big question um can you create a grass that's as good as an artificial surface it's a tough question because I, I i would say that there are quite a few flaws of an artificial grass right so um you know yeah it will withstand um traffic and you can play a lot on it but um there's a lot of problems that have come up with with artificial surfaces. So, I think obviously we're we're a seed company, so we're always for natural grass. But um, you know, the heat's a big issue. The sanitary is a big issue with um, with artificial fields. But at the same time, we don't have a silver bullet of yeah. a grass yet. There, of course, yeah. it, it doesn't exist. Um, 
and and I guess once we do find it, it might put us all out of work here. But uh, <laughs> but uh, no, there's no silver bullet, but there is definitely the right variety for the right environment, and there w- there are species that do better in different environments. So I think picking the the right species for your climate or your environment, and then combining that with you know, improved genetics or the the characteristics you're looking for in a grass, whether it be disease resistance or drought tolerance or salinity tolerance, whatever fits your situation the best. There are um, better species adapted to different climates. So picking the right species is is definitely a big part of that puzzle. Um, So I would encourage anyone to do their homework before any kind of major renovations. Yeah, so so no artificial real grass yet then. (laughs) No, we've been seeing some of the hybrid systems, and I think you guys have been playing around with some of the hybrid systems with synthetic and um, and, uh, and, and natural turf together. And um, And what do you think of that? Do you think that the the use of, like, cis grass and and fiber sands, are they beneficial, or do you think that we should go down a completely seed grass only I think there's there's places for that. I mean, if if it helps with your your sod strength or that uh, tensile strength of your field um, by putting some of these synthetic fibers, weaving it in, I think I think there's some benefit to combining those two together. Um, I I haven't looked into it too much. I know we've got a few fields um, that have done it before, but I think it's somewhat of a new and emerging field. So. Um, okay. I would leave my opinion until I see a little bit more data. <laughs> so, do you think that would be something that you'd incorporate to your like, testing and trials, or do you think it's because you, you're seed-based, it's something that you wouldn't particularly sew the two together sort of thing? I think we, we're seed-based, but we, um, we don't want to be blind to a changing industry. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to find solutions to help our, our partners. And whether that's, you know, the all the professional and collegiate sports stadiums that our seed ends up being on, um, yeah, we, we can't bury our heads. If there's new technology like that that's um, improving the turf, improving the playing surface for, for the end user, yeah, we have to be part of that research. As we spoke about the... Um seed development earlier how much does it roughly cost to produce a new variety of grass Uh, because we as again we we just get a bag that turns up uh, and we get price tag on it so how does that sort of work out um yeah we're probably afraid to actually look at the dollar (laughs) (laughs) goes into breeding a variety if we look at our r&d budget versus uh versus how many varieties are, are put out on a on a every year on an annual release it's it's a big big investment yeah. without a doubt and i think it would be a lot lot more if we didn't have university partners you know they're they're taking a lot uh on as far as doing collection trips i mean there's no private breeders in the u.s that are doing collection trips to the scale that Rutgers is doing and finding that new germplasm to bring into their breeding program so if we didn't have partners like them we wouldn't be able to release near as many varieties as we have um, they just opened up the amount of germplasm that we have access to so i think that has really brought down the cost of of sea grass seed and how much it costs to produce it but it still is very expensive you know you talk about not only breeding but then all the testing that goes into it you know put things into ntap and all the private testing that we do besides that it's um it's a significant investment and then we're paying um you know our partners royalties on top of every pound of seed that we sell as well so um some money comes out on the back end as well so it's it's definitely a big investment um but we feel that the, the genetics is the most important part. We don't want grass seed to become a commodity that's traded like uh, some of the forages are. We want, you know, we have unique characteristics that separate us from, from other seeds. There's other varieties, and we want to capitalize on that. So, And just the investment that goes into trials, um, real university trials on some of these varieties. Um, just to go into the NTEP alone, it's over $10,000 per entry. And you can be entering dozens of varieties over the course of a couple of years, and then, um, and that's just if you're going with domestic trials. And then, by the time you layer all the international trials on top of it, um, 
you know, some of the varieties we can have over $20,000 worth of cost just in trialing. And that's not development of the product. That's, that's actually the data to prove that the variety is, has a certain value to it. And, um, is it the top of the lists and the municipalities or the countries say that, yeah, it deserves to be marketed here. So there's, there's a big investment that the end user doesn't doesn't usually know about. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. Uh, there's a lot there that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. So, what are the most common misconceptions that you see? Good question. Yeah, I think part of the discussion today that we've been talking about a lot with misconception is um, uh, the amount of money, the amount of inputs that go into um, these these professional collegiate sports pitches or municipalities, the, the sports pitches. And, um, and you look at the, the amount of money and time invested to get a playable surface or a respectable surface and, um, and trying to educate the, uh, the groundskeep about the actual value of the seed. Cause as some of our partners have said, they, they really have no idea, or a lot of them don't have much of an idea how how much of an effort is being put in behind the scenes to develop improved turf varieties. So you'll have a lot of the consumers that they they'll go cheap on on on, on the bag of seed when that's the heart, when that's the uh, the first step in the whole process, and so. They think that they're saving some money on a bag of seed, and then they end up having to put down an extra one, two, three, four fungicide applications or, or applications for this disease or that disease, and then you'd like to ask them, so how was that investment for you? Because it didn't pan out very well. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, what we would push, I suppose, as much as anything is, um, you know, don't don't necessarily just listen to us, and, and we're not trying to sit here and say that, that we're the only ones with anything good on the market, but what we would push is go and dig into um, into uh, public trials, public data, and actually be educated about what the varieties are that you're purchasing. And if a salesperson um, or a store puts some sort of a tech sheet in front of you saying that this variety has these traits or that trait, um, you know the power of the internet's a pretty incredible tool today. Take a little bit of time and do a little research on your own because you might be surprised what uh, somebody's tech sheet versus reality actually is. So uh, that little bit of time doing your own research, it's probably a valuable investment. Yeah, yeah. I would kind of echo what Brett says, you know, as far as improvements year to year. I think I think from cycle to cycle we see big jumps in the turf quality um, so kind of staying on top of what the newest, latest, and greatest is um, for, for most cool season species is, is important. Um, you know, we see standards re-entered in the next NTAP cycle, and they could be a top five per performer in the previous cycle, and they'll drop off the first page, you know, out of the top 40. And then next year, just because we've cycled so far ahead, um, one good example I like to use, there was some work done out at Rutgers on improved bent grasses that have dollar spot tolerance. So if you use an older variety like Pencross that's uh, susceptible to dollar spot, um, if you're on a calendar application throughout the summer, um, you're spraying about eight times to control dollar spot throughout the summer season. If you get a variety that has tolerance or resistance to dollar spot, you can decrease that all the way down to two applications on more of a curative or kind of scouting program. So there's real savings there when you're talking about reducing six fungicide applications per season with just picking the right variety. Um, so yeah, so simply doing your research can save you a heap of money. Yeah, yeah, so it may cost a little bit more on the front end to buy that seed, but when you think about how much money you're saving in fungicides and um, you know, how much better that is for the environment, I think that's really something to consider. Um, so it's, it's you know, not a huge difference between some of the seeds, so really do your homework and, and, and get what works best for you in your situation, I think, is, is the biggest take-home. So. Okay. And finally, I'll, I'll leave this as the last question. As you just mentioned there about the environment, how focused on the environment are you? Obviously, you've, you need to produce a product to sell. 
um, to make the money to do the research. But how do you look after the environment along the way? Yeah, I think uh, as Brett pointed out before, the A-list, I think that's a big push for us, which is the Alliance of Low Input Sustainable Turf. Um, so we we really don't want to push for, you hear a lot of people saying that brown is the new green. Well, we think through breeding genetics that we can push for that green is the new green. We can manage everything with lower inputs and still attain the same high quality turf grass. Um, so yeah, we're really pushing in that field with our disease tolerance, our heat and drought tolerance and, and low fertility inputs. And that's how we're really kind of focusing our breeding program right now. So we don't have to put as many inputs in. Um, and I think you can see that in the bent grasses, um, you know, the fertility requirements have really dropped down since some of the older varieties, they can maintain them at much lower fertility rates. Um, a lot less fungicides are needed to be applied to some of these turfs. So, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're making small improvements, but if you keep stacking them on top of each other, it, it'll pay off in the long run. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and we'll wrap it up there, you know. Right, thanks, was, thanks for having us. Brilliant. Thanks for yeah, thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Again, big thank you to Brett Freeborn, Director of International Sales, and Dr. Chad Smith, Director of Agronomy. It was awesome to get the opportunity to speak with these two, and I hope you all managed to learn something along the way. Just a quick one before I end. Please do contact Brett, Chas, or myself if you're interested in going along to their field day on the 23rd and 25th of June next summer. 2020 you'll get to check out the seed production turf plots while learning all about mountain view seeds until next time please like follow subscribe and let us know what you think about this podcast we're always open to suggestions so if you know someone that would be interested in being a guest on the podcast please give me a message happy holidays and happy new year until next time